in the 
the light that is coming for the heart that holds on. And there will be an end to these troubles, but until that day comes, oh, still
singing that song a little while ago about to open up the windows and let the light in and it made me think of this moment when AJ everybody know AJ was in our youth group and we were we were doing a, a teaching on 1 Corinthians 10 13 so there's no temptation that has come to man that, or that's common to man but God will always provide a way out and and at that moment he looked Pastor James he was just so excited because we had the room kind of dark and kind of like it is right now and he just looked around the room and he says see that look underneath that door right there there's there's just a crack and there's a light coming through he said that's the way out ain't it he always provides a way out and think about that that there's light always around us and whenever there's light darkness surrenders amen there, darkness cannot overcome light but light can overcome darkness amen so if you look if you really want out if you really want to find that exit he's going to provide a way Sometimes we just kind of lollygag on the looking part. Amen. So I I just thank you today, Father. I thank you for bringing that back to my memories, Father. I thank you for just uh, always providing a way out, always being the light, Father. And I pray that as uh, you grow in me and I become more like your son, Father, that I become that light, Father, to where I walk, that darkness surrenders, Father, to where I go, Father, where I lay my feet, I'm claiming ground for Jesus and his kingdom, Father. I thank you and I love you and I trust you in all things, Father. And I say thank you for your touch. Thank you for your love and your healing, Father. And I praise you in Jesus' name. Everybody says, amen. Amen. Come on, guys. Amen. You, You hang on. In fact, uh, another funny story about that light, if I can. The other day, I bought a, a uh, the other day I bought a nightstand fan, right? You're not listening. 
Everybody's got to say hi. I missed you. Yeah. Oh, hang on. All right, let's 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 get seated, y'all y'all social bugs. Um, all right. Um, James has something that he wants to convey, uh, and then I have something that I want to do. So listen, please. It's just to add on to the to the light story because I bought a nightstand fan the other day and it it had listed all these details of what it does and and uh, it blows on you at, at night while you're sleeping and on that uh, the description it says night light and I'm like well that's cool because I, I I really don't like dark dark you know I want just a little bit of light and I opened up the box and plugged it in and I looked and it's got that little itty bitty light that you know, pretty much just tells you the power's on and that was the night light. And I'm like, well, this is stupid. I put my hand like, <laughs> I don't see anything. I look, and there's just like a little bitty dot on the ceiling. Like, man, I, they gonna rip me off. I said, that's one thing that don't work on it. And anyway, I didn't think about it till the other. Uh, I guess I'd fallen asleep, and middle of the night, I had to wake up to go do something. And I'm like, where's all this light coming from? <laughs> I didn't realize that it doesn't take much light. I looked, and the whole room was illuminated because that little that little dot, which you didn't think would be significant enough to make a difference. And Lorenzo will tell you, it's, it's, you can see everything that's going on in the room with this, that little light. So just saying, you don't got to be great or brilliant or uh, spectacular or the fastest or smartest. You just got to be a little bit of light. Amen? Amen. I qualify for that because I ain't none of those things. Amen? <laughs> Amen. Here's Pastor Rick. But also, in comparison to him... Because you were in the light, uh, the big light, when the, you first turned it on, right? Yeah. yeah. Annette, did you not say that there was somebody's birthday today? Oh, y'all already saying? Crap, I missed it. I think y'all should do it again. Did I, Y'all sang to Jaden the other day, and it was... It, it was too good. Y'all didn't do any drunken sailor, nothing. Did y'all do drunken sailor for Rick? No? Y'all did it right? Oh. Hey, you need to hush. I had enough of your mouth. No. Hey, uh, speaking of which, I have to apologize because I was wrong. Technically, I wasn't wrong, but technically, I was. See, I did change it, but someone flipped it on me. See this row right here? This row is supposed to be right there. Because this right here, this is the, the beginning, and this is the beginning. So this row right here is supposed to be right there. That's why. No, I, uh, yeah. I'll, as a matter of fact, I was going to do it Sunday, but I forgot. No, I mean, I had changed the, the amount of chairs. It's just this row was right there. Two, four, six, and seven over there. No, six and seven. All right. You got my one wrong for the year. All right. The one for the month or the day, huh, honey? Who's doing the prayer for tonight? For, for uh, I mean, the nugget? Miss Sierra? All right. Y'all give her a hand. Pray over tithes and offerings. If I can, pray over tithes and offerings before I pass the, the microphone. Father God, we trust you with our finances. Father, I pray that you just make the basket overflow. You have gave us a vision. You gave us a, uh, a calling in this community. Father, I pray that you find a way to finance it, put it on their hearts, Father, and let it just become a 100-fold harvest in Jesus' name. Amen. Here you go, Sierra. Give her a hand again. All right. He told me last night at 7 o'clock that I should do a nugget, and I said, okay. Well, good thing that uh, God gave me a lot of different things to look at. Um, but during service, I, before I say that, is uh, he dropped in my spirit <clears throat> about the pastors. And, you know, I don't know if any of y'all, you probably have, if we're being honest, uh, have doubts or thoughts that came about, about the pastors. About, oh, I didn't really like what they just said. 
Oh, really? Okay, that was kind of annoying. Oh, that was kind of rude. I want to say, do you know where that thought came from? Because I do. I know it's the enemy every time he tries to drop something in my spirit like, uh, no, I know their hearts. And I know that what they're saying isn't about that. He's trying to twist things because there's something you're supposed to receive from them. And because of that, the enemy wants you to get distracted and think about that thought that just popped in your head rather than what they're saying to you to speak into your life. Um, so I just wanted to say that because it, it dropped in my spirit real quick. <laughs> but um, about a week ago, uh, I was listening, you know, worship music and praising. And <clears throat> God just kind of dropped on me, and uh, Annette even posted once. She said, but God. And I was like, yes, but God. And, you know, I, I got to thinking, and I was like, why do we limit God? Because a lot of times we put God in our circumstances rather than <laughs> allowing him to take us to his. And, you know, the heavenly perspective has just been on my heart lately. And, you know, he's not limited by us. We limit him. We're the limiter. He's the creator. He's done everything. And... You know, I even wrote, he's not just a character in a book that we praise sometimes. He's the one that literally puts the mountain in front of you and can crumble it in a second, as long as we ask him to do so. He's the one that brings you the good thing when you feel like you're surrounded by everything bad. And he's the one that's going to provide for you when you have nothing. So why do we try to pull him down to our level? He wants us higher. He wants to see what he sees, and he wants us to walk out what he wants. And then when you feel like you're getting hit from all sides, all you have to do is take a breath and say, but God. He does everything for our good, and if it isn't good yet, hold on. And that's all. Amen. I'm blown away by this young lady right here because she came into our youth group when I was a youth pastor. What else was I? Were you a sophomore, Sierra? When you started coming, a sophomore or a freshman? Yeah, she was she was very young, but she I'll tell you she was she was a tough nut to crack. I didn't even know she liked me for two years. I mean, I because <laughs> she was hard. And then and then she started telling us about this guy that she met on the internet. I was like, oh Lord Jesus! <laughs> I'll tell you, I couldn't be more proud of y'all too. Thank you for for sticking around and being a part of what we're or what God's doing in this house and being part of our family. I'm so proud of y'all. Hey man, give my hand, guys. They're doing it right. Yeah. Pastor Nat, you ready? All right. All right. lost something and now I'm like freaking out because I can't find it. Sorry. Give me one second. I got to find it. I, it's not, it has nothing to do with tonight, but now I'm panicking. I'm like, where did I save it? Uh, do what? No, the Lord had just downloaded some stuff to me and I don't, oh God. <sighs> I must have, I must have inadvertently, I must have put it somewhere. Uh, let's see. Let me just search one thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I forgot about that. Oh, gosh. It's not in there either. Oh, well. It's in there somewhere. I probably just stuck it in the wrong folder, and I have, don't have time. Oh, no, I need it pretty quickly. So <laughs> we can't be waiting for him to be ready. I got it. <laughs> I need it. Do what? <laughs> it's me. I put it in the wrong. I know I did it the wrong spot. I organized my thing. Uh, all right. Nona, here's your stuff. Not for you. Hey, how's it going? Doing all right? A lot of gum. Mine was lollipops. 
Blow Pops and Tootsie Roll Pops. And worship music. That was the combination. Yeah. Well, you know, you know what? I know you can't, you can't afford to gain, gain weight. I know how that goes. But uh, the hardest thing was when you, because sometimes God delivers us and we don't have any cravings whatsoever and it's lovely. And then sometimes he doesn't, the cravings are still there. We're just walking through it. But the, my, the, the, the hardest thing for me was the, just the, the habitual, if I was, if I was really freaking mad, man, I was going to light up a cigarette. When I got in the car, which first thing you did was light a cigarette. You know, it, when you got your coffee, you grabbed your cigarette. You know what I mean? Like, those were the, that was the things. It was the habitual things that I always did. That was the hardest thing for me. It, that was. Hey, don't let down one spirit, pick up another, okay? Don't do that. <laughs> uh, Josh, go ahead. You can, you can do these. Y'all may not want these. You can throw them away. I don't care. Uh, I just know visuals sometimes are helpful. All right. Uh, no, I do, have, I do have last Wednesdays. If y'all want last Wednesday's handouts... Yeah, this is it. Here, you can do this. Anybody want, I, it's, um, we're still doing 13. I'm going to review some things. So, oh. Yes, uh, Will has them. It's freezing in here, isn't it? I, I concur, my friend. I concur. I was trying to adjust some things, and it, yeah, it was it was off. So there you go. Probably didn't sound good on mine. <laughs> I think it's left over. So. Uh, oh, you're welcome. We need another one? Oh. That many people didn't get theirs? I mean, this we're on week three, the same one. Hang on. Uh. <laughs> All right. You can go make copies of these, but I have to have this one back. More people needed 13. Oh, all that. This is actually, but here, let me, let me, let me um, take a pen. out where it said I had the number 13 written on it. Oh, my goodness.
Sorry, we're just waiting for her to get copies. I don't want to start until everybody's got what they need. So y'all can talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> Those of you online, sorry. Yeah, that is true. <sighs> y'all don't forget, the stirring is Friday. I, uh, I was a little... With, the, the, the word will be uh, chagrined, right? That's that. I, the, um, the quarterly prophetic advance was supposed to be March 31st and April 1st. I had it on my calendar because like a good girl, when we were there, I put it on my calendar so I wouldn't forget. So when we were doing the stirring, I made sure that I didn't conflict and guess what? Donnie got the dates mixed up. So we did the flyers and sort of an announcing that it was the 24th and the 25th. So it is so bloody cold in here. Can somebody, uh, I need the heat, I mean the air, like not running for just a minute. Um, I know, hell is freezing over, Pops, I understand. Um, anyways, so the... Uh, I texted Cheryl because I'm like, okay, like we were in the meeting and it was the 31st and 1st. And she said, I'm so glad you texted me because she was, she was like, I could have sworn I said it was going to be the 31st and the 1st. And then because she didn't have, um, I'm going to get you a fan, baby. Uh, anyway, so the, they, the dates are changed and now I don't get to go. So we're actually going to be having our stirring while they're doing their prophetic prayer meeting as well. Jamie Leip's going to be doing worship because, uh, you know, President Trump's coming to Waco, right? Do y'all know that? Um, so I won't say anything about that. Okay, so um, <laughs> I can't say anything political. I'll get clicked off of YouTube again. They just are searching. They're back in 2021 digging through stuff right now. Anyways, I'm like, I don't understand. I, I don't have that big of a following for people who are worried about what I say. But anyways, um, I'm sure I'll stick my foot in my mouth again. But uh, so we'll be doing it here. They'll be doing it there. We'll just join them in the spirit. And uh, yay, it'll be awesome. But we're going to miss the, I'll miss the prophetic advance. I'm sad about that. All right. Everybody have their stuff? Uh, oh, this is not going to be okay. You need to pray over everybody. I heard something today that blew my mind. You remember when Peter, I don't know, I'm just going to share it because I want to. Remember when Peter, um, at first when he, uh, Jesus came to him and he said, hey, Peter, you know, can we just cast your boat out a little bit? And he got in the boat and he was then, he was preaching a sermon and a bunch of people got healed and set free and all that. And then during that time, he had also had been toiling to try to uh, catch fish, and he didn't catch anything, right? And so Jesus told him to, to, to put his nets back in. And apparently when, I guess when it's really hot, fish go deep. I don't know, all you fishing people can tell me that. Do I want to go fishing? No. Uh, no. Mm -mm, no. There are a lot more other things I can do to relax. Not, no. Mm -mm. Uh, <laughs> you do you. <laughs> I'll do me. I will eat the fish, but I will not go catch it. Anyway, so they, he got, God blessed him, right? He, he pulls in all the fish. Well, then when we fast forward to the end, when Peter, remember where Peter gets upset after Jesus is crucified and he decides he's going to go fishing because that's what Peter, that, that was his business. That's what he knew. So when he goes back out to go fishing, this time he doesn't, he hears Jesus say, have y'all caught anything, right? And as soon as he hears what he heard in the beginning when he didn't believe God and God said, put your net back in, he was like, nevertheless, at your word, right? Is what he said. Nevertheless, at your word, I'll lay down my net. So he did it. And then when he grabbed all the fish in, he said to Jesus, I'm a sinful man. And he bowed down, called him Lord. He was shocked. So then when we fast forward, at the end, 
Peter is, he's in the boat, he's upset. Jesus is on the shore, and he's, he's calls out to Peter, and he asks him if they caught anything. When Peter hears Jesus' voice, what does he do? He throws off his coat, and he goes running into the water. And when he got to the shore, who did he encounter? Jesus. And what was Jesus doing? He had been grilling fish, right? He would have been making him breakfast. So as I was listening to this message, he says, he was talking about the progression of a disciple. How in the beginning, when God, when, when God um, asks us to do something by faith, we, we really don't believe him, but we do it because we know we have, you know, he's like, what else you got to loot? You haven't, you haven't caught anything. You might as well do it. And then he realizes when he did that by faith, he received all this fish. But when we see later on, when now as Peter has relationship with Jesus, when Peter threw the net in the water, he threw the net. The net still went into the water. The Bible tells us they caught exactly 153 fish. But Peter wasn't catching the fish. Peter was on the shore eating the prepared fish that Jesus had made for him. And he said, Peter owned the boat, but Jesus owned the fish. And when we obey God, when we get to a place where we're walking in faith, the first time when he did it, he was setting a precedent. Peter did not know who he was. He said, I'm a sinner. You are God, right? But now as Peter goes forward, he says that when Peter hurt, as now in relationship with Jesus, we get to a point where fish are waiting for our obedience. I found this to be quite fascinating. There are things God has, it doesn't matter what we need, what breakthrough we're looking for, whatever we are limited with, we serve a God who's unlimited. And if we obey God will take the unlimited resources he has. What we need is already assigned. The fish were just waiting for the net. But the net wasn't the blessing. The blessing was the prepared fish. You know how much easier it is to go to the shore and have fish prepared than it is for you to catch fish? But when you walk in complete faith and obedience with Jesus, you not only get the fish that are assigned to the obedience of your net, but you also get the fish that's prepared by the hands of Jesus. That is the double that we receive as we walk in obedience to Jesus. I was just in my car stunned. Like I, I was just like all day long. I'm thinking there are fish waiting to get into my obedience. There's money waiting to get into my obedience. Isn't that good? It was deep. Seriously, I mean, we serve it. We do we ever? We don't think about God that way. We think of God. We just want just the enough. And God's like, no, I will give you bounty in your obedience. But even more than that, I will prepare for you with my own hands things you don't even have to work for. I don't know about you guys, but that's the kind of stuff I'm looking for right now. To be honest with you, so I thought I'm a little off tonight, and it's because of that message. I've just been like, boo, all day long. <laughs> My brain's going in 50,000 different directions. And I'm, I'm having a hard time getting it all settled. Okay, fast forward to tonight. <laughs> that was just for free. Um, I was getting everything together, and I really just felt like I needed, I know some of y'all are going to be very upset. I needed to go over some of the things we went over already last week. Um, because towards the end there, I um, kind of sped up through that. And honestly, at the end of the day, we only learn when we rehearse things more than one time. And, um, well, I'm not going to apologize for that. I don't know about you, but I'm kind of dumb sometimes. And I need to hear things more than once for me to actually catch it. So uh, I was trying not to do the whole thing. So I was trying to turn... Uh, so, you know, I listened to the message again. I just wasn't happy with any of it. So, 
that's just me being a little, I don't know, what's the word? Uh, don't even tell me what the word is. Okay, let, Ashley, let's go to slide number 11. Let's do that. I'm not going to do all of it. If you weren't here, well, there's not that many blanks. I guess I can give you your blanks real quick for those of you who weren't here. All right. Sorry. I lied. Go back up. <laughs> Just follow the bouncing ball. Okay. Slide. I'll read this. I'll go ahead and verse, go to slide two. I'll read the scripture first. He says, uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, unless you, Jesus, uh, Holy Spirit, just come in spite of me and anoint the word. Breathe a fresh breath upon it. We love you. We honor you, Jesus. I ask that your word be implanted in the soil of our hearts. Your word is good, and let our soil be good as well, in Jesus' name. All right, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 through 5 says, Let no one deceive you. By any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was with you, I told you these things? All right, so Paul talks about two uh, events that are part of the end times, and one is the falling away, and the second is the unveiling of the Antichrist. So the falling away, this is the apostasy. Uh, it is the um, apostasia means falling away, a defection, Strong's defines it as a defection from truth. Now, we know Jesus is the truth, amen? So uh, when we're talking about, and when he says the word the there, that is, that's a definite article. So it's not just any falling away from truth, it's the falling away from truth. So there's going to be a massive amount of people who are going to be falling away, defecting from the truth and from the word of God. And the second event he reveals there is, is the unveiling of the Antichrist. Uh, th which is the son who brings destru destruction. So there's uh, different versions say it different ways. Uh, you can, it can say the man of sin, the man of lawlessness. Uh, and either way is okay. It just reveals his character. The Antichrist is always going to be opposed to, to God. Uh, that's what Satan is. He's always opposed. So that never changes. Um, the son of perdition or the son of destruction, that is just... Basically, it, it is the prophetic word about his future. He is doomed. He will, he will be destroyed. Um, so when he says there, let's look at the, uh, the Antichrist revealed there quickly. I don't think you have any blanks here, do you? Mm, all right. So here we just read the character. He says, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember when I was with you that I told you these things? Um, now, we know that the Antichrist, we know at the halfway point he's going to be setting up where he's going to be sitting in the Holy of Holies, where we have the abomination of desolation. And because we know that little tidbit of information, that means that we then know that in some way, shape, or form, the, uh, the, the temple in Jerusalem is going to have to be playing a, a part in what's happening at the end times, okay? Because this has to be this has to be rebuilt back up again. Now, currently at the moment, the the Dome of the Rock is controlled by the Muslim Brotherhood, I believe, and then um, but the Israeli police, like they they provide their protection there. So Israel doesn't have complete control of it over it, you know. And this is uh, this is the most sacred place for them. Um, but we know that at some point there. We've got to see sacrifices 
begin again. There has to be a structure that is there within. Uh, but, you know, Satan's a copycat, so he he's trying to do this in a way that replicates what God did in the beginning. So we know that that's going to have to be um, built back up again in some way, shape, or form, where Israel takes control over that, and then they begin to do sacrifices. Because remember, the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. So, which is, you know, I, when you think about it, I, I find it f- just phenomenal how God just rolls all this out. Um, because once Jesus came, and, you know, we're about to celebrate um, the resurrection, so we're, we're at the place right now where Jesus was declared the prince that is to come. When he came down on into Jerusalem riding on the back of a donkey, and they waved their palm branches and were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, what... Hosanna, they were saying, the prince who saves, right? This is the one, the promised one. So when that, those same people that were waving the palm branches were the same people who were just hours later going to be saying, crucify him. So Jesus was declared the prince who was promised. And then he goes to the cross, but Israel rejected him. Now, Jesus was the promised lamb of God, right? Right? So this entire time, they have these feasts and these ceremonies that were set up to uh, replicate what Jesus was going to be fulfilling in the natural. After Jesus, as the, the Lamb of God, comes and lays down his life, there's no need for the Passover any longer. And Jesus knows this, right? Because he's the Lamb, So there was a period of time as the gospel was going out and they were sharing that Jesus was the promised Messiah. He was there to, uh, he was the son of God that was promised. There was a period of time where God allowed, there was, I mean, you know, with everything, God has seed time and harvest. And God allowed them time to repent and come to him. And, but at some point it had to end and when the temple was destroyed, Israel was built on how they feasted, right? How they sacrificed. They had this entire system set up. When Jesus came, he fulfilled it all. So they had no need to continue doing the sacrifices. And the temple was destroyed. So the Jewish people, as a religion, no longer had the center that they needed, that, that temple being destroyed, that was the place where they were going to go give their sacrifices and offering unto God, and it is now destroyed. So they had to reinvent the wheel because it's either we reinvent how we do these sacrifices or we accept Jesus, and, oh, we don't want to accept Jesus, so we're going to make our own new way of doing it because we don't have a temple to go to anymore. Because Jesus is the lamb. But in the end times, that structure That sacrificial system is going to be, I don't know the extent of it, but in some way, shape, or form, it's going to begin again. Israel's going to take control of it. It's going to begin again. And as they do, then three and a half years in his tribulation, the enemy is going to desecrate the Holy of Holies. That's where the Temple Mount is. Everybody with me? All right. So, I said it again. Gosh darn it. Uh, (laughs) Sorry. Okay, let's go to the next one. Uh, Yeah, oh yeah, no, number five, yeah. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. He says, and then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming, the coming of the lawless one, is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteousness, deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth 
that they might be saved. Now, we're gonna, we started there with verses 4 and 5, and we're going down to verse 8 and 10, and we'll go back up to 6 and 7. So he says, the lawless one will be revealed. He's going to, so let's look at these blanks, and I'll try to be fast through this, because, oh, my gosh, it's already, really? It's that late? Jeez Louise. It's my life right now. Okay, consume. Consume is the word there to consume, use up, and to destroy. It says there that God is going to consume. What's the exact wording? The Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth. <clears throat> so he's going to destroy with the pneuma, the breath, the pneuma of his mouth. The word mouth there is stoma. And it is defined as mouth, the thoughts of a man's soul that find verbal utterance by his mouth. And in the context of Jesus Christ, it means the edge of the sword. So Jesus is going to consume Satan with or destroy him with the breath, the spirit of the edge of the sword that's coming out of his mouth. Amen. Jesus is coming back in, in the book of Revelation on a horse with what coming out of his mouth? A sword. Okay. Okay. So Matthew 4.4 4 says, uh, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the stoma of God, okay? So your blanks, your next ones are, Paul states that the lawless one will work in the power of Satan with all powers, signs, lying wonders, and unrighteous deception. So it no matter what we're going to talk about right now, about the power that Satan has and the things that he's going to do to deceive people, we need to remember that Jesus is going to destroy him with the spirit of the sword that's coming out of his mouth, okay? He is going to be destroyed. He has no victory. He's already been defeated. Amen. <clears throat> so the lawless one is going to work in the power of Satan... And he's going to have signs, lying wonders, and unrighteous deception. The word signs there, look, this is the same word for when Jesus did signs, miracles, and wonders, and when the apostles did signs, miracles, and wonders. And it's the exact same word when you and I do signs. Okay? So these aren't separate. You, you remember when um, Moses was going to go before Pharaoh? And he would lay down his rod, and his rod would become a snake, right? And he said, pick up, that, pick up the snake by the tail, and then it would become a rod again, right? And then, but then when Moses went before Pharaoh, what did the Egyptian magicians do? The same very thing, right? So even the Old Testament is full. In the Old Testament, you see there are different signs and wonders that the enemy can do just as well as the prophets and the man of God could do. People were resurrected in the Old Testament. People are resurrected in the New Testament, right? What made Jesus different was not the signs and the wonders that he did or even uh, the resurrection of the dead because even Elijah resurrected the dead. What made Jesus different was that the kingdom of God was made manifest and overpowered the kingdom of Satan. That is the only, and it ain't the only difference, it's a massive difference, but that is the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament, is that the kingdom of God, Jesus said, if I cast out Satan by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So the king, the strong man, Satan, who was on the earth, who was bringing people into bondage and stealing and lying and killing and all of that. Jesus came as a stronger one, as the one with ultimate power, and he bound the strong man. He was able to cast out devils because when Jesus came in the full power as the son of God, devils could not stand in his presence. He cast out devils. He had power over all of the strength of the enemy. Even unto death, he was able to raise himself up. So because the kingdom of God 
is so much more powerful than the kingdom of darkness, but that does not mean that darkness doesn't have power. Jesus has all power and all authority. So Satan is going to be doing things that are going to look miraculous. Even he himself is going to have a wound to the head and die and come back to life. It's very important that we, Satan comes as an angel of light. Corinthians tells us that. Because Satan was an archangel. So be, and he was, he was a cherubim. He was beautiful in all of his ways is what God told, what God says. And he was leading worship and he was able to see the face of God. But there was iniquity found in him. There was pride found in, in him. And that is why he was cast down. But because Satan, look, he doesn't come to us looking all evil and gross and scary. He beguiles, he deceives, he comes looking good, like an angel of light. It looks like light. And if we are only bedazzled by the little things that happen, but we're not concerned about the heart and the motive and in the power in which someone does those things, then we can be deceived. Look, you know, if our own hearts can deceive us, you better believe we can be deceived. Look, I was watching somebody online. I ain't going to say who. I was watching somebody online, and I was like, I, I, I was like just watching for, you know, a little bit. I was just looking at, you know, like something was just bothering me, but I didn't know what was bothering me. I'm like, what's rising up inside of me? But we got to be cautious, especially as we move closer into the time when Jesus is returning, because we've got to make sure that we know the heart. Uh, is the tree good fruit? It's got to be rooted in Christ. It has to be rooted in the truth. And it's, and it's up for you and me because Jesus said he wants us to do greater works. We are people who are supposed to be carrying the anointing of God. We've got to steward the anointing of God. How do we steward the anointing? We do it by remaining in intimacy with him and by obedience. We don't steward the anointing without obedience. We've got to obey God. But what was I going to say? <laughs> I was like, oh, my brain just went. Anyways, we cannot, be, we cannot be moved by all the tingly stuff that we like. And look, we all like the tingles. We like the activity. But if the activity is rooted in flesh, we don't want it. And if it's rooted in something other than the love of Jesus Christ, we don't want it. So we have to be cautious about our own hearts, and then we've got to be cautious about the people who are speaking into us as well. Amen. I know that just went over like a big old fat lead balloon. But, I mean, Eve was in the garden. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Wasn't like she was outside of the garden and he came and tricked her. He was in the garden with her. So, you can see what's on my brain right now. Okay. So, that is, so then uh, lying, the word there is, that's the word pseudo. So, you've heard me say pseudo Christ and pseudo peace. What does that mean? That means it's an intentional falsehood. It is something perverse, unholy. That's what impious means. It's unholy. It's deceitful. So he says he's going to have lying wonders. So we cannot be just in awe of somebody's exceptional ability We've got to make sure that what's enabling them is the spirit of God and the anointing of God and not something else. So lying wonders, and then he's, and the next one is deception. He's going to bring deception. Uh, 
here's a bombshell. Deception means deceit. Oh, what? Uh, <laughs> but the root word means to beguile, to deceive. What is beguile? Beguile is to bewitch, to persuade, to attract, to charm. You know what I mean? So uh, I'm going to give you this blank, but I'm not going to get into all this right here. I did, I did horrible tonight. Did I get that late? Did I, did I get, did we? Y'all going to have to give me at least 10 minutes, right? Like for real? If you got to go, just get up and leave. I love you. I'll see you Friday or Sunday. I'll be mad at you. All right. Your next blank is parousia there. Because uh, he says in verse 9 there, he says that, let me read exactly how he says it. The coming of the lawless one. It is the parousia. This is the same word that's used of Jesus coming as well. So Satan is going to have an arrival, just like Jesus is going to have an arrival. And I had more stuff to say there. I'm not going to say it tonight. Okay. <laughs> Just tuck that in your thing there. All right. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. All right. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to soon be shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word, or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. So that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself to, to, that, that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was with you, I told you these things? And now, everybody say, and now, you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then, everybody say, and then. So we have, and now, and, and then. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy the brightness of his coming. Uh, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all the power signs, lining wonders, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Um, in verse 6, he begins with and now. That word now is the Greek word nin, and it means at this time, present, and now. When is and now? It's now. And now, he means now. Everybody got, I know, it's deep. Oh. And it matters. I know, not to you guys, but it does matter to people who want to argue. And now, present. So everything he says following, nin, and now has to do with the present tense. Everybody with me? So he says, and now you know what is restraining. He's talking about something restraining now. And he's telling the people they know what is restraining. Then in verse 8, he says, and then. The Greek word for then means <laughs> at that time. So now means now. And then means then at that time. So and now you know what is restraining. That's what he said. I'm just repeating what he said. And then, oh, and then, and then. <laughs> and verse 8 says, and then the lawless one will be revealed. So we have a present tense sentence, and then we have a future sentence. Now there's a re something restraining, and you know what it is. But then at that time, everybody with me? All right. <laughs> at that time, the lawless one's going to be revealed. The restrainer is now the lawless one at that time. Everybody with me? Okay. <laughs> 
Two separate time periods is all I'm trying to make sure we all get. Okay. The restrainer. Who is it? What is it? Verse 6. And now, presently, so let's just say, and presently, you know what is restraining. That's what, it's, what, he, that's what he's saying to the church. And presently, you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. So we know that something is restraining. We know that the church knows who or what is restraining. And then we also know that the restraining at some point has to end and be removed. Everybody with me? I didn't want to rush through this again, and now I am. Oh, bloody God. Okay. So he's giving us an order to the events, right? Presently, there's a restraining going on, but then in the future, the restrainer is going to be taken away. So restrain. What's it mean? It means to hold back, to detain, to retain, to restrain, and to hinder. So we can clearly see that the restrainer holds back the manifestation of evil that is in the person of the lawless one. And that lawless one cannot be revealed until the restrainer is taken away. Everybody with me? Make sense? Does it sound confusing? Yes. If it does, it's okay. And now presently, you know what is restraining. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. So lawlessness is already at work during the time of restraining. You know what is restraining, and even though there is a restraining going on, lawlessness is still at work. That's exactly what he says. Oh. Now, he who now restrains is going to do so until he's taken out of the way. So the restrainer is what? In the way. Yes? <laughs> I'm going to do this every week until y'all act like you are so flipping happy to hear it. <laughs> now, I'm not going to absolutely kill you again with all of the neuter and masculine participles and articles here because you'll just want to shoot me. But I will just say this. You can listen to last week's again if you want to put yourself through that torture. Uh, but he uses a neuter and he uses a masculine. Now, when we talk about the pneuma, the spirit of God, we use the neuter because he is a spirit. He is neither male nor female. But when we talk about Jesus, we talk about God the Father, we use what? We use masculine because he's a masculine. He is God the Father. He's a masculine. There are like two sexes. There is male and there are females. I don't care what your pronouns are. If you die and we dig you up 100 years, we're going to know whether or not you were male or female. I don't want to, I don't know, like no one knows what you feel, what you felt like. We just know what you are. God is the Father. He is masculine. So in the scripture, he's referred to, the Holy Spirit is referred to as a neuter and in, as a neutral. And in the, uh, as we talk about God the Father, he is in the masculine. So Paul uses both. He uses both the neuter and the masculine. That is why, if you notice in the version that I was using, I, the word he is capitalized because we know then, because he says the restrainer, he is taken away. We, there's a capital H because it is a masculine. It's a definite masculine participle and article. It is, he's talking about God. God in the form of what? The, neut the neutral, the spirit. Holy Spirit is still God. He's in the neutral, in the neuter, because he's neither male nor female, but he is the spirit of God. Thank you, Ashley. I'm glad you got it. Okay. Also, in order to restrain the lawless one, 
who will be empowered by Satan, the restrainer. Oh, did I skip page? No, I didn't skip. I didn't skip. No, I didn't skip. Okay. So we know, based on what Paul said, that in order to restrain the lawless one, the restrainer is not restraining lawlessness. Because the mystery of lawlessness is happening on the earth. That's exactly what Paul said. But the restrainer is restraining the lawless one, who is Satan. Yeah, everybody? Okay. <laughs> and, yeah, and some of y'all are like, why? Because look, I get phone calls. I get text messages. I didn't get it. So I'm just saying, let, I, I want to make sure nobody is confused. So we've got to see that lawlessness is on the earth, but the lawless one who is to come is being restrained by something. We haven't defined what it is yet. All we're doing is looking at what Paul said. So let's go to our questions. Oh, I'm so hungry. I can't wait to eat some Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A. I know. See, now you're hungry, too. You're like, oh. <laughs> go, the, go ahead and go to the next one. I'm going to do that. <laughs> I'm with you. I've been there, dude. I've been there. I understand. All right. So we have to look at, we know, based on just these few scriptures that we just read, verses 6 through 8, the restrainer is a principle so because we know that there is, he's, he's, a, he's restraining, right? He is restraining. We also know that the restrainer is a person. He's a masculine, right? So he is, there is something restraining, something, and there is then a masculine person who is a restrainer. And then we also know, Paul tells them that the identity was well known by the church. So he's talking to people. Look, he's talking to people just like you and me, people who are born again, filled with the Spirit. That's who he's talking to. He's saying, look, based on what he said, they know who it is. And then we know that the power of the one who is the restrainer has got to be greater than the power of Satan. We're just trying to figure out who it is. I hope you know who it is. I hope you figured it out. It's the Holy Spirit, just in case anybody was wondering. Okay, so Holy Spirit is the restrainer. Now, there is... A lot of people thought, okay, what Paul was talking about here had to be the Roman Empire. Because the Roman Empire was a, was a government that, I mean, look, they all expected when Jesus was coming down, they were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. They were just, they were ready for him to go take on the Roman Empire. They were ready. But it cannot be the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire came to an end. So some, so some, some blah, blah would say then, okay, if it's not the Roman Empire, because they were a powerful government, then it must be all governments is what Paul is talking about that's restraining. And Paul does mention that governments do restrain some evil, and it does restrain some lawlessness. But is there any laws or government that are strong enough to stop the lawless one? I mean, no. It, so it just can't be human governments. That would make no sense. The government's not strong enough to stop Satan. <laughs> and how many of us follow all the laws of the government? If y'all sped on the way here... <laughs> I mean, seriously. 
And then it wouldn't make any sense either because when Satan is actually revealed, he's actually going to be using the government. He's going to be using the government. So it can't be government that restrains. If he's going to be using the very thing that we're trying to say is restraining him, that don't make no sense. So, okay. Go, go to the blanks. I know. My, that clock is fast, by the way. All right. So the restrainer has to be God. It has to be God himself. So the, here's the pre-tribulation argument. The restrainer is God, okay? And the instrument of restraint is the church who has who living inside of it? God himself. We are Christ's indwelling. So many scriptures. Probably should have written them all down, but I didn't. <laughs> But we are Christ's indwelling. He, he indwells inside of you and I, right? And that's the way God wanted it, praise God. Now, I, you remember way back in the day when I did the whole thing on why the church is important, how we define the church is important? Because the reason that's important is because if... The church, we are, we are filled with the Spirit of God. He dwells inside of us. And we know that the restrainer has to be removed in order for the lawless one to be revealed. He can't come in on the scene. He's going to be on the earth, but he can't enter in in his leadership role, right? his coming, his parousia, because the, the person, that lawless one, he's going to come on the scene, and then he's basically going to have a baptism of the fullness of evil. Like Jesus was baptized with the fullness of the Spirit of God, he's going to be filled with, that, with all of that evil because it's being restrained right now. So he says the restrainer has to be removed, and then the lawless one is going to be revealed. So if we cannot say that Christ will disindwell us, then that means, at least for argument's sake, the church can't be on the earth. in order for the lawless one to be revealed. Are we Christ's indwelling or not? Does the Spirit of God live in us or not? So the pre-tribulation theory is, y'all have your little, your, can you put the, that last slide up? I'm just gonna I'm just gonna put this up here quick, drop it on you like a hot potato and walk out the door. That's what I'm gonna do. <laughs> Cause I didn't get anywhere tonight. God bless it. I'm so irritated. Okay. <laughs> uh, Jesus. Okay. This is just the sequence of events. Okay, for this little moment of time. Here's the cross. We have the day of Pentecost. All right. Paul tells, we know that we are the church. Go back, listen to the, I'll tell you what part number it was. When we talk about the church and we define the church, who is the church? What is the church? We are not Israel, right? We are within that parenthesis, that, uh, that parenthesis time. God has us in a dispensation of the spirit of God and the grace of God, right? So we are in the dispensation of the spirit. Remember the dispensation class. Okay. So this parenthesis here, again, is showing the same thing. So we are the church. Now, Paul told us that while the church is in existence, the mystery of lawlessness is now happening. We have evil on the earth. 
We have lawlessness on the earth. So even though we have Christ dwelling inside of us and we are sealed and indwelt by him, there is still evil on the planet. But the evil on the planet, the lawlessness is not to the extent that it will be when the lawless one comes and is, for lack of a better term, baptized with all of that evil, okay? So this is the period of the restraining. Now, I said a minute ago, it, I know it may have seemed like I was just chasing rabbits, but it was intentional because Jesus said, if I cast out Satan by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And you and I, he says, we are supposed to be what? Casting out devils. That's part of our commission to go and do. Why? Because he's letting, he wants us to understand that because the spirit of God dwells inside of us, that the kingdom of God has now come upon us. We are now possessed by Holy Spirit. There's no other term you can use but possessed, owned. If you've been baptized with the Holy Spirit, you are now possessed by that spirit. That power is now controlling you. And he says that because the kingdom of God is upon us and that spirit now controls us, that now we now have authority, Jesus tells us, to go bind the strong man. To go and take those who are in torment, being harassed, and even being possessed by evil, to go and bring the kingdom of God to them and the power of the spirit, casting out devils, letting the enemy know that the kingdom of God is inside of us, and we now have dominion over that kingdom. This is what all that means. So the restrainer is restraining back evil so that you and I can go work the harvest. We can go get souls saved. We can release uh, people who are bound and captive, full of addictions and being harassed all the time. We are not just to go get people born again. Yes, we're supposed to, but we are supposed to be bringing healing, release to the captives. Come on. This is our call. If that makes you uncomfortable, you probably need to check your heart because it's about to get intense. So some of the devils that we are dealing with and comforting ourselves with have to go first. That's another message by God. <laughs> Y'all better get ready, though, because I am tearing it up at home. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I know you're with me, Josh. <laughs> We're going to do this together, brother. Okay, so this is the period of the church. So based on pre-tribulation theory, if the restrainer, if we can say that Holy Spirit is not going to disindwell us, right, then that means we know that the Antichrist cannot be unveiled until the removal of the restrainer. Well, the restrainer goes when we go. You know what I mean? <laughs> but that does not mean the Holy Spirit is not working on the earth. God is not limited only to his church. However, that is what he said he would be doing right now in this dispensation. Remember, when the church is removed, what happens? We go back into that. We'll talk more about that because Paul actually doesn't say we go back to the law. He says we go back to Abraham's blessing. That's another message. All right. So the rapture, as the restrainer is removed, with the removal of the restrainer, with the rapture, what happens next? Immediately, the apostasy happens, the falling away. At the same time, right after that, the Antichrist is unveiled. Remember, the Antichrist cannot happen until the restrainer is removed. And Paul tells us that the apostasy is not going to happen or will happen right after as well. These two events are the two events he's talking about that he's reminding the Thessalonians about. Now, just for good measure, this is where the Jews get converted. That's another message. <laughs> now, during this time, there is a gap between the rapture and when the beginning of the tribulation happens. Okay? Whether that's a week, two weeks, there's a small interlude, 
between, right? Because Satan, the Antichrist, is going to be revealed. He's going to have to take over ten nations, right? He's going to make this common, whatever he's going to, whatever you want to call it. And then as he takes over control, remember, he's going to handle commerce and all that. And then the word tells us that a peace covenant is going to be signed. And at the signing of the peace covenant, what happens? Boom. You're in the tribulation. You are now in the last week, the seven-year period. Everybody with me? So we know then, so this is, this is a moment of time. There's a small interlude. By the, because remember, the church has to go, chaos has to ensue. With the removal of the church, millions of people, billions of people being caught up in the air, moving, graves opening up, bodies. Psh, what? Crazy stuff. So this massive event has got to be used by the enemy for his benefit. So you're going to have people falling away as the church is removed. People are going to be falling away. At the same time, Satan is going to be coming up, and he's going to be anointed to be Satan on the earth then. He's going to be wielding his power over nations and commerce and all that kind of good stuff. And then all of a sudden, he's going to come in, and he's going to to broker peace with Israel for the first time. Iran and Israel are going to be at peace. And the Bible says... As soon as that agreement happens, we know that the time, click, click, the stopwatch has started again. Remember the stopwatch. All the way back 21 weeks ago. (laughs) So then you've got, of course, you know it's seven years. The abomination of desolation happens halfway in between. And then Jesus says we go up as a church and we come back as a bride. So this will have to be... The Feast of Trumpets. This is the Atonement. Feast of Tabernacles. Amen. I'm dropping that little chart on you and running out the door. Amen. All right. You can text me if you want to later. (laughs) I'm sorry. This did not go the way I wanted it to tonight. I don't know what's happening with me. All right, Jesus, we love you so much. All right, y'all, pray for Friday night if you want to. Please, like, maybe just fast. I don't know. Fast something, maybe, like a coffee or one meal or two between now and Friday. And uh, just prepare your heart. God wants to use you. He doesn't want to just use me. Amen? He doesn't want to just prophesy through me and Lorenda or a couple other people. He wants to use you. So prepare your heart to be used. Amen. All right, Jesus, we love you so much. Amen. I'm sorry. Don't get mad at me. I love you guys. See ya.